So let's talk a little bit about moral reasoning and moral development. Where does moral reasoning come from? How do we develop as human beings to become moral creatures? And is this are these theories that are consistent across countries and particularly consistent between men and women? Um, because some of the arguments are that men and women develop in a very different moral ways. So moral standards and reasoning, um, the reasoning process for those standards have to be applied to different issues. So it has to be um, a policy and a process that we've learned that we're willing to uh, apply consistently across the board. Um, we want to be able to develop our critical capacities over our lifetime. So <clears throat> as we'll see with Kohlberg's theory is that people evolve over their lifespan, that, that it's not a one and done. We don't um, believe or behave in a certain way and that we never change those beliefs. Um, there's few constants in life and change is one of them. And change is always going to be there. Um, we're always going to change. We're always going to grow. We're always evolving um, as human beings in our brains, cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, etc. All those different areas. Um, and moral reasoning is used to, for us to evaluate the moral standards. So our society sets up a moral standard and says this is OK and this is not OK. And we use our own reasoning processes to decide whether or not um, we agree with those state, uh, those points of view. So in terms of moral development, uh, Kohlberg has three stages, two of which are listed here on this slide and the, the next one's on the next slide. And Kohlberg argues that we go from pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional points of view. Pre-conventional means we learn like we do as kids. It's reward and punishment. We do the right thing. We get rewarded. We do the wrong thing. Um, we get punished for it. And the goal is that you have to obey. Consider this as, as what, what it was like when we were kids growing up, where our parents said, do what I tell you to do or you'll be punished. And you had to comply. You didn't have any options. You weren't taught why. You weren't taught how. Um, and possibly because as young children, we don't have the capacity to fully understand and to reason through things. Um, so it's very what we call instrumental, it means that there is something there that we need to achieve and we need to do, and and that is based on how we're trained and taught as kids growing up. Then there's a the conventional orientation that happens as we grow and learn where we start to understand interpersonal interactions, the consequences of our behaviors, <clears throat> and we respond accordingly to that. It's still a very law and order perspective, meaning that um, we have one, um, in, in the conventional manner, our goal is to um, think about the laws, why they exist, what they do, what matters, um, and we follow them, And but we can create our own sort of interpretations of things. So our first two levels, as we said, were pre-conventional and conventional. Pre-conventional, it's just simply reward and punishment. Conventional is what does my society say I should do? What do the, the norms of the community say I should do? I will follow that. And the post-conventional is where we take independent, impartial points of view and decide what are what should be the right thing to do no matter what. Um, not taking into account the issues of community and things like that. So Kohlberg also argues um, in the post-conventional, um, what we're looking at is social contracts, how we relate to each other, what are some universal moral principles that, again, are ad addressed in an impartial way. And this is the level that we should aspire to, that post-conventional is better than conventional and conventional is better than pre-conventional. It's a very hierarchical approach. The biggest um, uh critique of Kohlberg's work is that it was done on men and it and it reflects the way men think about moral development it doesn't really address how women address and think about moral development and it's very different our brains are different women think more in the um the cerebral cortex men tend to be more in the primal um the primal parts of the brain um 
And so it is important for us to really understand, particularly as men develop at a different pace and, in, and cognitively than women do, um, and we know this, it's, it's, it's supported in science, that there are two different ways that people develop their moral thinking and that women actually do it quite differently than men do. Um, Carol Gilligan is one of the biggest uh, feminist uh, researchers, feminist theory uh, 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 sociologist, looking at moral development and as it compares to men and women. And women tend to focus much more on the impact on the community and the impact on the relationships that they're engaging in and being responsible and caring for those interpersonal relationships when we think about what moral reasoning is. So the highest level of moral reasoning for women is about how do we ensure <clears throat> that we are caring for each other and it's not impartial, that we have to pay attention to the impact um, that we have on our community and on the people around us versus men take that more impartial point of view. It's rational. It's logical. It follows suit. And therefore, I'm going to follow these rules without really taking into account the interpersonal interactions amongst people around them. Um, and so... <clears throat> Carol Gilligan also doesn't believe that post-conventional is necessarily, you know, better um, than conventional. It's just different. Um, and so I think it is important for us to recognize that male and female development um, is, um, is different, um, although maybe not as different as Gilligan may have thought. Um, and the goal, of course, is that there are some differences in the way people think about things um, and they emphasize things differently. So I think that's the most important thing. <clears throat> um, moral development for women progresses towards better ways of caring. Um, and that's true. Um, and I think for women that post conventional really focuses on caring for the community rather than caring about themselves. And when people don't evolve past that, it's just a different per perspective and a different point of view on that. In terms of the structure of moral reasoning, moral reasoning includes some basic principles that we have to be logical. And what is logical for one person is not logical for another. So that becomes a big challenge, right? Information about what is being evaluated, we have to make sure that the information we have is accurate, relevant, complete. Can we always make sure we have complete information? Not always. We can strive for it, but we don't always have it. And moral judgment sh is, should be about um, being consistent in the way it's being evaluated. Now, that is something that certainly we can do, but we also have to recognize there are cultural norms and, and that are different in the way um, we think about these perspectives. <clears throat> so the structure of moral reasoning makes sense, should be logical, should be relevant with good information that's complete, and then it should be really consistent. And maybe that's just not the case. Maybe, um, um, you know, we're doing the best we can to be as consistent as possible. And I take it more from the perspective of uh, Her uh, Herbert Simon, who basically told us that we, we can't have perfect information. All we can do is satisfice, be satisfactory, acceptable with all the limited information that we have and to make our decisions based on that. And so we can try to be as logical as possible, but that's not always uh, what we can do. So let's talk a little bit about the steps for ethical behavior. There are four basic steps, and there's a graphic in the next couple slides that you'll see the in a get at these issues. <clears throat> Number one, we have to be aware that something is an ethical issue and we have to be aware of it. And if we're not aware of it, that's a challenge. So one of the first things that we need to do when we do ethics training, for example, is to make people aware where there are possibilities for ethical dilemmas and what ethical challenges actually look like. So we have to be aware of a circumstance and recognize something to be an ethical dilemma in order to be able to behave and engage in ethical behaviors. Next is we have to make a judgment, meaning we need to look at it. We have to decide and assess the situation and help us to be bring that awareness into um, more detail so that we can say, well, I have to choose A or B. Why should I choose A? Why should I choose B? What are the challenges? What are the problems? What is the impact of choosing one or the other? 
then we have to make a decision and decide that, yes, this is what I should do. And then we actually have to take the action. There are plenty of times people stop at, well, this is what I should do. And then they never take the next step. So ethical behavior actually requires us to act on those assessments. So let's start with recognizing a situation as ethical. We have to know how to frame it um, in a, such a way that makes us think about it from the perspective of ethical reasoning. And, in, and typically it requires ethical reasoning if it involves serious harm um, that is concentrated, likely, proximate, meaning close by, imminent, meaning really soon, and potentially violates our moral standards. So we don't always know that something is going to violate our moral standards until we're in the midst of it. But if you think it might potentially violate your moral standards, then you have to sort of set that tone. <clears throat> it's important that we remove obstacles um, um, in recognizing a situation is considered ethical or unethical. You know, it's easy for us to rationalize things, to put labels around it, to you know, throw off responsibility to somebody else to say, oh, it's not my problem. It's somebody else's issue. I'll let somebody else deal with it. Once we start hearing ourselves engage in these labels or rationalizations or diminishing behaviors, these are biased behaviors that we are engaging in to minimize the struggle we feel with the ethical dilemma. And once we're once we feel that struggle and then we engage in these behaviors, that should be a red flag for us that something is going on that we need to pay attention to. So in judging an ethical course of action, we may be um, distorting our point of view by biased theories about what the world looks like or what it acts like about how others behave and about ourselves. So our bias, those three forms of bias are about the worldview, about others and individual people, and then about ourselves. And so we have to recognize when we may be engaged in biased points of view about all those three levels and certainly about organizations and what their intentions are. Um, because at the end of the day, really, organizations' intentions are about the individuals and their intentions. Um, judging the ethical course of action really depends on things like the ethical climate of the company. When the ethical climate is about um, being benevolent and taking care of people and taking care of the environment, we are more likely to see good ethical behaviors. Same thing with good ethical culture. Ethical culture encourages people to behave ethically, and an unethical culture encourages people to do whatever they want to do as long as it makes the company money. Um, and so we want to be, stay away from egotistical cultures and climates and focus more on more benevolent and collective uh, cultures and climates. But Acting on the decision, that final step, really depends on a whole bunch of things. How strong and confident we feel in ourselves, our ego strength, the loss of control we have. You know, if we feel like we are losing control, um, it's really easy for us to um, uh, feel like um, we can't accomplish what we want to accomplish. If we feel helpless and hopeless, we're not going to want to do it. Though The more control we feel we have over our environment, the more likely we are to uh, to want to do that. And then lastly, the response to authority. If you truly believe that our, our desire, our response to authority um, has to be strong and that we should follow what the authority says, we're never going to be able to combat um, the challenges we feel when there is that ethical dilemma for us because we become adherent to the authority rather than doing what we believe to be the right thing to do. This last slide is figure 1.2 in your textbook and it's just a graphical or a, a, a visual representation of those four steps. Number one, start with recognizing the situation. Number two, 
judging the ethical action, being aware where there might be biases attached, deciding to do the ethical course of action, um, knowing and recognizing that the climate and the culture um, is, an, is, is an issue out there. And then, of course, an issue at that the textbook talks about, which is moral seduction, which is uh, the subtle pressures that, uh, that lead an ethical person to do something that they know is wrong. It's a slippery slope sort of thing that happens where, you know, you, ju you rationalize one thing and you can find you know, how good people can do bad things. And then lastly, the desire and the intention and the ability to carry out the decision and how important it is for us to be able to do that independent of sometimes the impact that it has on others.